All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Caroline Kitchens. I'm the Director of Government Affairs at the R Street Institute. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues. We have Clark Packard, who is a resident fellow and trade policy counsel at R Street. He's also the author of a new paper titled Harvesting Another Trade War Ad Hoc Farm Subsidies and Our WTO Commitments. I'm also joined by my colleague, Philip Rossetti. Philip is a resident senior fellow in our Energy and Environment Program, and he's the author of a paper titled Economic and Environmental Potential of Carbon, Off Carbon Offsets May Be Underestimated. So we'll go ahead and put those papers in the chat. Um, but briefly, I'm going to have a discussion with each author about their papers, and I'll save time at the end for a few questions. So if any of you have questions you'd like to ask at any point, feel free to put it either in the chat box or in the questions feature. So first, I'm going to turn to Clark Packard. Uh, Clark, in your analysis, you detail how the U.S. has really led the global charge towards a rules-based trading system. How has that changed under former President Trump and now President Biden? Well, first of all, thanks, Caroline, for hosting this, and thanks for thanks to Phil for joining. Um, yeah, look, that, that's a really good question. Uh, after World War II, you know, the United States sort of led its or used its position uh, as the dominant economic and global superpower to create um, a, a rules-based trading system, sort of in the image that it wanted to see, um, and and it, that system has been pretty successful. Um, and you know, it, it paid tremendous dividends to the United States and the world um, over the last 70 years. Uh, that started to collapse a little bit under President Trump. He started to act outside the, the traditional norms and confines of the World Trade Organization and, and that system. Um, look, I, I think there are a couple really important things to note on the, on the front end. First of all, agriculture is very abundant in the United States. 20 to 25% of it is exported every year. Um, and it's super important politically and economically for the United States. Um, our farmers and ranchers, but uh, at the same time, our farmers and ranchers need more market access abroad because agriculture is so abundant. Um, but, but look, this is a sort of a well-worn story, but it, I think it bears repeating. Um, you know, one of the President's, President Trump's first actions uh, in office was withdrawing the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. TVP made strides at liberalizing notoriously closed agriculture markets, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and the, the agreement was designed to sort of constrain China, um, you know, provide market alternatives in the Pacific region to, you know, this massive country in China. Um, and, and now U.S. exporters, agriculture exporters in particular, are at a competitive disadvantage in those markets relative to their peers uh, since TPP moved forward without the United States. Uh, then shortly thereafter, the Trump administration imposed national security tariffs on uh, imported steel and aluminum from uh, basically every country in the world, including longtime allies in NATO and Mexico and Canada and the EU. Um, and, and those countries then retaliated against uh, American exports. In particular, uh, you know, they targeted agriculture products because of the political nature of, of the, the political strength of, of the agriculture industry in the United States. Um, the Trump administration then turned its sort of ire on China, right? Um, and engaged in sort of a back and forth uh, tariff war with China and naturally Beijing uh, targeted, again, US exports, particularly soy and other farm products. And so to deal with the political and economic fallout um, of, the trade wars and the lack of market access or the lost market access abroad, um, the, the Trump administration dusted off a New Deal era uh, program to dump a bunch of money. That was the Commodity Credit Corporation. Uh, and they basically showered subsidies on farmers and ranchers. Um, on top of that, when COVID hit, uh, the federal government provided massive financial support to the ag industry. Um, and all, again, all of that was in addition to normal ag subsidies we provide, the stuff that you and I have written about, and you know, whether that be the crop insurance program or others. Uh, the taxpayers for Common Sense estimates that between 50 to 75 percent of net farm income in 2020 was, came from federal subsidies. Um, and again, that's, that's totally unsustainable. It should be much lower than that. Um, and the reason why is pretty pretty straightforward, right? Subsidies are non-tariff barriers to imports, and they distort export markets. So crop insurance, for example, in the United States artificially depresses U.S. prices, 
and thus makes foreign exporters uncompetitive in the U.S. market. Um, it also allows U.S. exports to, to undercut global competition unfairly. Um, and you know, the, the, the crux of my paper is that these uh, subsidies could violate WTO rules. Um, and the problem with that is that it could lead to more trade wars, uh, sort of this ongoing, never ending cycle. Um, as in countries, you know, if, if these uh, subsidies were challenged in the United States um, and, and the United States were to lose that case at the World Trade Organization, uh, the US would be faced with a tough choice. It would either have to remove those subsidies uh, immediately, or it would give other countries the green light to retaliate heavily against the United States for its subsidy. Um, and, and, you know, I can, that's, that's the basic crux, but I can sort of walk through uh, the, the overall argument about why these subsidies potentially violate WTO rules, if, if that makes sense. So sure, um, look, you know, the, the United States is a member, of, as a member of the WTO, is a member of, of what's known as the Agreement on Agriculture. And in the Agreement on Agriculture, the US agreed to a maximum ceiling of $19.1 billion worth of annual subsidies. It, it, it's the maximum amount the US can provide uh, for market distorting subsidies. And the WTO uses sort of a, a streetlight system to classify subsidies. There are green box subsidies, which are non-distortionary subsidies. Think of these as like food assistance programs. And the United States provides of, you know, $120 billion roughly a year and green box subsidies. And that's not really a problem because it doesn't distort international markets. Uh, next are blue box subsidies. And these are market distorting subsidies that require farmers to limit production. The US doesn't use these types of subsidies. Other countries do, but the United States doesn't. Where this is really a problem are what are known as amber box subsidies. And amber box subsidies um, are sort of quote unquote, more than minimally trade distorting uh, subsidies. Um, and those subsidies tend to are tied to current production levels and market price supports. Um, and so those are the subsidies that, that the United States has agreed to cap at $19.1 billion a year. Um, and then there are what's known as uh, red box subsidies, which are totally prohibited. The United States does not use them. Those would be like export subsidies or import subsidies. Um, but the Trump administration's ag, ad hoc ag subsidies um, are almost certainly amber box subsidies. Um, and, you know, the United States, uh, again, has that almost, you know, right about $19 billion a year cap. Um, after the paper came out, the, the U.S. notified the World Trade Organization uh, that it came in just under the $19.1 billion cap. Uh, but it's worth noting that the United States switched methodologies for how it reports the subsidies. The U.S. used to notify WTO on a crop year basis. Instead, it's using uh, a fiscal year basis now. Um, and so if on a crop year basis, I think that the U.S. would have violated uh, that $19.1 billion cap. Um, I'm also skeptical, and I, I hate to, to sort of assign bad faith, but I am skeptical that the United States accurately classified some of its subsidies. I think they might have set out and said, okay, we're going to, the max we're going to give is 19.1, and we're going to reclassify certain subsidies as, as you know, potentially non-trade -dist distorting subsidies. Um, but even if it is under the, the $19.1 billion cap, there's another avenue that, that countries could potentially challenge the United States, right? Uh, the United States is also a member of the WTO's agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, uh, which basically try to try to measure the amount of distortion. Uh, and if it's significant enough, it uh, it allows other countries to essentially retaliate or bring at least bring a case against the United States. And if the United States were to lose that, again, be faced with that unenviable choice of removing uh, the subsidies or face foreign tariffs or, you know, the WTO giving sort of green light to, to more tariffs. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the crux of the legal argument. Um, but I think, and, and to be clear, if, if you count the COVID payments towards this, I think the United States clearly blows through uh, the $19.1 billion cap. But I think that, I think it's safe to say that most countries would be less inclined to challenge sort of temporary emergency measures that it took in response to 
something as serious as, as COVID, right? I, I think it's more likely that countries uh, would be looking to challenge uh, the subsidies the United States put in place as a result of the trade wars. Um, that's not to say that, that countries wouldn't, but countries right now and WTO members are starting to ask a lot of questions about the structure of these uh, subsidies and, and sort of how they are impacting global markets. Um, so, I mean, that, that's sort of the legal case, um, but, but I, can, I can sort of walk through what I think that the United States, at, at the back end of the paper, I, I provide a, a number of recommendations the United States, I think the United States should take um, to kind of get back to where we need to be or, or moving in the right direction, at least. Um, first of all, I, I would suggest the United States should eliminate the, the Trump administration's tariffs. They're, they've been a failure. Um, $650,000 cost for every steel job we've saved from the tariffs, right? That's a very high price to pay uh, for one steel producing job in the United States. Uh, the New York Fed estimates the, that the tariffs have cost the average family about $850 a year. Um, and, and more importantly, I think with respect to China, they haven't changed China's trade policy practices. I think the United States has legitimate uh, complaints about the way China engages in international trade and investment. Um, and so I, as, but, and maybe all of this would have been justified if it, if the actions the United States took, whether it be investment restrictions or tariffs, um, if, if those actions had led to a change in Chinese trade and commercial policy practices, then maybe you could argue this would be justified, but the early evidence suggests that they haven't really changed uh, any of their behaviors. Um, so if the United States eliminates its tariffs, other countries will eliminate their tariffs uh, on American products, and that would eliminate the need for the subsidies in the first place. Uh, that would get us back, I think, to sort of a pre-trade war status quo. Um, but even that is not good enough for American agriculture exporters. Um, the U.S., I think the United States should very quickly rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Again, we're at a competitive disadvantage, particularly our farmers and ranchers in, in the Asian Pacific markets um, are at a disadvantage to, to their competitors. Um, likewise, I think the United States should begin to pare back its legacy farm subsidy programs. Again, uh, the, the crop insurance program being a, a prime example of that. If the United States makes a credible commitment to pare back its domestic subsidies, that's the biggest bargaining chip that US trade negotiators have to get other countries to lower their trade barriers, particularly at the World Trade Organization. Other countries desperately want access to the largest consumer market, uh, the biggest economy in the world. So the United States needs to say, okay, we are willing to compete fairly uh, in the agriculture space and, and start to curb some of our domestic agriculture subsidies. Um, on top of that, I think the United States should also pursue regional and bilateral trade agreements with the EU and others, right? The, the NAFTA and the USMCA, uh, the, the subsequent agreement to, to NAFTA has been a tremendous success, particularly for US ag uh, producers. And, and you, know, you can potentially argue that manufacturing in the United States got hit when the United States uh, admitted China into the World Trade Organization or with NAFTA that, that you know, production shifted to lower cost uh, venues. But I don't think you can argue that the United States did not benefit on the agriculture side. I, the United States is so unbelievably good at producing lots of agriculture um, that even foreign competition, you know, the United States out competes that. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I want to see the United States do that on a more fair uh, market leveling basis. And I, I think that that's possible. But again, this all comes back to the United States taking credible steps to kind of curb agriculture subsidies. And, and look, the United States, the work you've done and, and others at our street have done, um, show pretty clearly that agriculture subsidies in the United States are, are nothing more than sort of crony capitalism, uh, a big handout to big corporate farms. Um, and it's not really the safety net that we sort of, you know, the average person on the street thinks it is. Um, and, and on top of that, look, agriculture subsidies are pretty bad for the environment. They're costly to taxpayers. And, and finally, again, they, they distort international trade. And, and all of those things, I think, make the, the issue right for reform.
Um, so, you know, with that, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and to Phil. Thank you, Clark. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment box or in the Q&A feature. But for now, I'm going to turn to my other colleague, Philip Rossetti. So Philip's paper highlights a different issue. It focus on, focuses on carbon offsets. But I think both issues really illustrate how markets are the key to ensuring a healthy and a vibrant ag sector. And that's whether it's access to foreign export markets with trade or access to carbon offset markets. Uh, so I'm gonna kick it over to Phil. Phil, can you first explain what are carbon offsets and how can carbon offsets produce a climate benefit? Uh, sure, so yeah, I, I guess um, to tie it into ag, you know, first I'll, I'll mention kind of carbon offsets. A carbon offset is this action that you're going to undertake, which is either going to reduce emissions uh, by avoiding some uh, emission opportunity, or you're undertaking some activity uh, like planting a tree or you know, having cover crops or something like that, which uh, re increases the size of carbon sinks for uh, sequestering carbon dioxide in soil or, or in plant matter. Uh, the reason this has become so important in the agriculture space is that, as Clark noted, you know, the, the subsidy treatment in agriculture is just horribly inefficient. Uh, and you know, he mentioned kind of the crop insurance program, and, and that's something that has actually been kind of problematic for uh, the in, environmental uh, purview because uh, it, it heavily incentivizes, uh, you know, just kind of going through topsoil and not really actually uh, producing environmental benefit because those things uh, up until recently weren't covered. Uh, so long-term sort of environmental sustainability was never incentivized under the sort of government uh, managed programs. Carbon offsets have become really interesting in the ag space because now we're seeing like, hey, there's actually not just a lot of opportunity to make agriculture more environmentally friendly, uh, but also it, it could really be a huge benefit internationally for global emissions. So agriculture is about 9% of US emissions and it's about 24% of global emissions. Uh, the United States is also, like, for most areas, a much cleaner producer of food products and it's a huge agriculture exporter. So oftentimes the things that we do in the United States are delivering a global benefit because it's preventing a less efficient agriculture practice abroad or it's helping to preserve uh, forest land and things that would otherwise be uh, cut down to, to produce less efficient uh, you know, agriculturally producing land. Uh, especially when it comes to like cattle meat, uh, the US is, is much better. But these subsidies, uh, which oftentimes prop up this industry are just not very efficient. You know, Clark kind of mentioned the steel example. Uh, it's this, in economics, we call this as, uh, you know, dispersed cost and concentrated benefit. And it really kind of obfuscates just how uh, inefficient the practice is because you look at what you cost uh, or what the cost is to you as a taxpayer or a consumer, it seems relatively small, uh, but then it can be uh, highly concentrated to an individual, but often it's not just that individual getting money, it's this overhead and all these other sort of economic distortions that make it inefficient. Uh, carbon offsets have been kind of this interesting thing where it's like, hey, you know, there's a lot of industries that are trying to reduce their environmental footprint, but they don't have an easy way of doing that. Uh, and it's, you look at like industry, uh, like cement production, you know, it, you cannot do that without fossil fuels and, and high combustion temperatures. Uh, airlines are a good example. Sustainable aviation fuels are really, really expensive. Uh, but offsets, you know, can cost about a few dollars a ton, you know, usually under $10 per ton for a ton of carbon dioxide that you're uh, offsetting. Uh, whereas some of the practices for emission abatement can be hundreds of dollars, sometimes even thousands of dollars a ton. So it's much more efficient. So we did at the Arts Institute was try to look at this and say, okay, you know, if this is increasing in popularity, you know, how much of a difference can offsets make? Uh, you know, is, is this a big enough uh, opportunity that could have a big impact on global emissions, but also uh, what's the sort of economic benefit? And up until now, you know, when people start to tally the carbon offsets, it's about 200 million metric tons, like globally is what the sort of current commitment is. And then the, uh, the size of the market uh, is expected to be about like $200 billion by 2050. Uh, now, in looking at what is the total potential sort of carbon offsets by 2050, 
it's about uh, four to 13 gigatons. And global emissions right now are about 50 gigatons. And we're hoping to you know, stabilize that. They have to go down to actually uh, you know, achieve the climate objectives that are outlined uh, by you know, Conference of the Parties and, and this, these international agreements like the Paris Agreement. Uh, so carbon offsets could be a huge uh, benefit, you know, certainly not all the benefit. Uh, but then when we start to look at the economic value and not just sort of the market value, there was a, a report from uh, the International Emissions uh, Trading Association, ITA, and they estimated the uh, value to be about $340 billion or so by 2050. And then if you discount that to present day value, it'd be about $138 billion. And looking at what we think the economic value would be, uh, comparing that to if you're going to mandate these changes and just say, hey, you have to you know, cut out all uh, industrial emissions or all international aviation emissions through whatever means necessary, regardless of the cost. Uh, the benefit, we think, by 2050 would be about $350 billion uh, in present day value. Uh, so that's you know, more than double uh, kind of the net present value of the IETA estimate, which compared it to a carbon price or you know, some sort of relatively low cost uh, emission abatement opportunity. So tying this back into the ag sector, uh, this is really important because you actually create this international incentive for uh, environmentally friendly practices through the presence of a market. Uh, you're essentially saying, hey, you know, airlines or you know, industrial producers or you know, big companies um, like tech companies that want to offset their uh, energy consumption, uh, that they can do that by actually uh, investing in these agricultural practices, natural conservation practices and all of these other opportunities, which regardless of where they occur, produce the same environmental benefit because carbon dioxide is a global uh, pollutant, which is dispersed you know, evenly regardless of where it's emitted. So this helps to avoid the subsidy distortion. It's not just saying, hey, you know, we don't care how much it costs, you know, we're mandating it. It's essentially allowing the market to say, okay, you know, this opportunity might be really high cost, so we're not gonna do that, but this one's really low cost, so we're gonna pursue that. Uh, and it removes this sort of central planning mindset and the central planning bias from the environmental problem and lets people who are closer to the solution say, hey, you know, this is actually really easy for me to do. Uh, and it wasn't profitable for me to do it before, but now I will. Uh, I will say though, you know, carbon offsets are you know, probably not gonna be uh, an easy solution to get to because there are a lot of controversies about the additionality uh, and the permanence. Uh, so additionality is this idea of like, is the benefit actually additional? Are we getting something that we weren't going to get before? So sometimes you look at uh, like people buying up forest land to say, hey, we're preserving this forest uh, and preventing it from being cut down and that that's gonna provide a, an environmental benefit. But if that you know, wasn't the case, if they're wrong in that as assertion, then there is no additional benefit. Uh, and then there's also the permanence aspect some carbon offsets do have a permanent benefit. So in the agriculture space, we have precision agriculture and you're reducing your uh, fertilizer usage. You know, that is a, a permanent avoidance of a greenhouse gas emission. But if you are looking at um, you know, something like a tree and if that you know, tree dies and decays, uh, then you don't have this sort of you know, permanent long-lived emission abatement. Uh, so there's a lot of you know, controversies. It's why the verification aspects are hotly debated now and super important. Um, yeah, but we're pretty confident saying that if you can get that verification and you know that you have that benefit, uh, it's a much more economically efficient way of doing it. And it also can bring a lot of capital to uh, the sector that doesn't rely on uh, government uh, subsidies. Philip, given all these challenges, what do you think is the best path forward for policymakers? What can policymakers do to address some of these questions surrounding verification and also help us realize the benefits of carbon markets? Uh, that I feel like is a million dollar question. Uh, and this is, you know, kind of ties into Clark's example of international trade. And the US was always kind of a leader in this area of setting the rules. Uh, and that's been extremely helpful globally to economic growth. So when you think about carbon offsets, where the US hasn't really been at the table and we've seen you know, some international programs like Corsia, which is you know, part of this UN uh, effort to, to get the international aviation emissions offset. Um, you know, there is some of that, but a lot of the carbon offset markets right now have been under controversy because like you know, renewable power in China 
and they have these offsets and we don't really know what's going on, but there's a lot of opacity. And you, know, you, you would see this all the time where a company will say, oh, you know, we've totally offset our activities. And then when people start to dive deeper into it, it's like, you know, wait a second, this doesn't seem like it actually has an additional benefit. So addressing that problem is gonna be key for policymakers, uh, actually getting it in, into a policy format that is really about setting a, a sort of standard that is not an impediment to private sector activity is hugely important because right now the carbon offset markets are really in the private sector, which is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, a blessing in the sense that the private sector has much more motivation to do it right uh, than the government does, uh, but also has created a, a huge amount of confusion for a lot of carbon offset consumers where they just don't know, you know the quality of different markets and, and what they're buying. And, and it's a huge, uh, what we call in economics, a transaction cost. You have to go through all this information, do all this research before you can be confident of your decision. And it makes it uh, difficult for uh, you know, sort of more conventional consumers to engage in that. Uh, I think the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which, uh, you know, passed uh, recently, you know, is trying to get some uh, USDA efforts into at least allowing for government assistance to say, you know, here are the things that we think are worthy of, uh, of verification and, and help to set the parameters of what's good verification and bad verification. Uh, that's a good first step. In terms of going beyond that, I think it's, important to do more of that where we can kind of set a, a benchmark of this what this is what verification means and this is what we think is good globally uh, without being in a situation where the U.S. government says okay we're taking the reins entirely on, uh, on carbon markets because we we don't want to end up in a situation where uh, we're cutting out opportunities for carbon offsets that will otherwise occur. Great well thank you Philip and thank you Clark. I have put your papers in the chat box. I highly recommend any of our participants take a look. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Have a good day. Thank you.